Hello there, uh, we're here in uh, Cork Harbour. Uh, I thought I'd introduce people to the, uh, to the beauty of Cork Harbour, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, but I wanted to give people an update, uh, as we said we would, uh, on some of the issues that you've been raising over the last couple of weeks uh, online with me. Um, first of all, on the agricultural side, um, uh, really the big issue for, for farmers has been beef prices. Um, uh, we've, I've just been at the Tullamore show uh, in the last couple of days and a lot of uh, beef farmers are finding the going rough. Uh, we've had really poor prices for the last six or seven months, uh, falling from all-time high prices last year, which makes the fall uh, seem even worse. Um, you know, first of all, uh, the reason for low prices right across Europe, uh, not just in Ireland, uh, is that essentially what's happening this year is that there's an increased supply of beef and there's reducing consumption of beef right across the European Union. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, and that has resulted in beef prices right across uh, Britain, Ireland uh, and across the continent of Europe uh, all falling this year, roughly at the same rate as, as how prices have fallen in Ireland. That's not a lot, a lot of consolation, I know, to farmers. What are we doing to solve this? First of all, um, this week we launched a public consultation process on setting up what are called producer groups. So in the future, uh, what we're going to put in place is producer groups that will negotiate on behalf of farmers as a collective. So we will have different producer groups in different parts of the country representing five or six or 10,000 farmers maybe, uh, negotiating then collectively with factories to make sure that farmers get a better deal. At the moment, a farmer has to negotiate individually uh, with a big factory or a big processor and it puts them at a big disadvantage. Secondly, and we're getting cooperation from the, the processing industry on this, we need to have much more clarity and better communication around spec, quality control, standards, uh, so that when farmers bring an animal to the, um, uh, to the factory, uh, they know the, the price that they're likely to get for it, uh, penalties and bonuses on the back of that price as well. We've also increased the marketing fund for Board Bia. Uh, to make sure that we're targeting markets that we think have potential for expansion and growth. Places like the Netherlands, Germany, Italy and of course further afield outside of the European Union. Um, so there are a whole series of things happening. There's a particular problem also um, for a trade that would normally be happening in the west of Ireland and in border counties where um, uh, farmers from Northern Ireland would come and buy cattle here to finish them in the north to slaughter them there. There's a labelling issue. Uh, which, which, which I'm working with uh, my colleague north of the border, Michelle O'Neill, to try and solve as well with UK retail outlets. So we are working um, intensively actually to try and improve uh, prices within the beef market, but I can't set prices uh, and I wouldn't be allowed to do it even if, I, even if I tried. So beef will be a big priority moving into the autumn. The other big issue I know for the, for the food industry generally and, uh, and for farmers this week has been the announced uh, Russian ban on all EU uh, agri-food products essentially. Um, this is a big disappointment and a big setback from an Irish perspective because we've seen the Russian market grow and expand in the last five years in a really exciting way. Uh, last year we exported 235 million euros worth of food and drink to Russia. Uh, and we, we had predicted that that market was going to continue to expand and grow rapidly. Uh, so, you know, big entities like the Irish Dairy Board, like Kerry Group and others were planning for investments in Russia uh, to expand and increase market share there. So clearly that is, that's taken a backward step. But I think it's important to put this into context uh, because of the 235 million euros that we sold into Russia last year, about 136 million of that uh, is, is not affected by the ban. Uh, so what's called tea extracts, which is uh, a product produced by Pepsi here in Cork, which is the basis for iced tea. 77 million euros of exports went from Ireland last year, and that's totally unaffected. Uh, infant formula, totally unaffected. Um, um, high protein ingredients, uh, totally unaffected. Uh, casein coming from the dairy sector, uh, unaffected by the ban. And, and of the 18 million euros uh, of dairy product going to Russia last year, uh, 11 million of that was casein. So, you know, this is a, this is a bad news story clearly for trade, uh, but there is still going to be a strong trade in a number of, uh, of products from Ireland to Russia, even with this ban. So last year, for example, 12 million euros of, uh, of beverages going to Russia, unaffected by the ban. Um, where the ban, I think, is going to affect us 
uh, uh, is to add to the existing problems that have developed this year between the EU and Russia, whereby they have already banned pig meat from the European Union because of an outbreak of African swine flu in the Baltic states, nowhere near Ar Ireland, but affect affecting us here. Uh, there was also consequences from a, a Russian visit and inspection to some Irish dairy processing facilities and, uh, and seafood facilities where um, you know, we were working out some technical differences of opinion in relation to those inspections. So, but I think on top of the existing problems, this actually only adds you know, 8 or 9 million euros uh, of lost opportunity. Um, which of course is not welcome and because of the trends in growth of trade with, with Russia this is, this is moving in the direction that we don't want to move in but we will of course work with companies now to find alternative markets for their products and we will be ready when that Russian ban is lifted to get back into Russia uh, and Bordbia have a specific Russian unit now set up so that companies that would have been trading with Russia will now be able to work with Bord Bordbia to find alternative outlets for their produce. And already 40 companies um, have been uh, engaging with that unit within Bordbia. So if you trade with Russia at the moment and you're worried about this ban, uh, talk to them uh, and they'll certainly be of help. There's a, there's a number on the, the Bordbia website um, that will allow you to contact them. Okay, two of the other uh, issues that have been coming up online with me for quite some time now. Uh, one is animal welfare generally. Uh, and um, first of all, I'm pleased to get people constantly interacting on this because we're trying to understand uh, the areas of animal welfare where we need to put more focus and quite frankly, put more money. Um, we have probably the most comprehensive piece of animal welfare legislation anywhere in Europe now, finished, finalized uh, over the last uh, number of years. So we do have the capacity to act now uh, for people who abandon animals, for people who are cruel to animals, for people who aren't feeding their animals properly. Uh, and we also have an animal um, welfare helpline uh, that people should use if they're concerned about something that their neighbor is doing or something that they see down the road. It's 1850, uh, 21, 19, 90. And people should use that um, animal welfare um, hotline and we will follow up on it. Um, as I say, for the first time, we have the real legal tools here to work with Garda Siakana to take cases against people who are cruel to their animals and who don't uh, live up to their legal obligations now um, uh, in terms of animal ownership. Uh, so whether that's horses, whether it's dogs, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and actually, we have been acting on that. You know, if you look at the number of horses that we have seized from people in the last 12 months, you're probably talking about 5,000 or so. Um, uh, and uh, likewise with dogs, we are now being proactive in actually looking for problems and trying to solve them. Uh, and as I say, uh, we do have the firepower now to be able to do that in a real and credible way. Um, so continue to let me know, uh, continue to, to use the Animal uh, Welfare Helpline uh, and we will continue to try and progress uh, a respect for animals in Ireland using uh, legal means now, uh, as well as obviously persuasion, working with welfare organisations uh, to make that happen. Uh, the, the second big issue that is being raised with me uh, is concern around um, salmon farming, uh, in particular the application uh, in Galway Bay for a large salmon farm. Look, can I just reassure people here? Right? I am not going to license any farm that in my view is not environmentally sustainable, is not sound, does not make sense from an environmental and biodiversity point of view as well as a commercial point of view. So there is a balance to be struck here. We have a robust uh, and very uh, lengthy process around an application for a salmon farm license in Ireland now. Uh, it's been described by many people as a gold-plated licensing system. Uh, in the past we had a very poor licensing system, we've now replaced that and improved it. Uh, and so uh, I will make recommendations on the back of um, uh, of advice, technical advice coming from experts to make sure that we do get the balance right between allowing uh, a commercial salmon farming uh, industry in Ireland but only in places that are suitable, only at a scale that's suitable uh, and under a license that actually manages and monitors and controls the activity to make sure that it's done properly. And that will be the case in Galway, it'll be the case in Bantry Bay, it'll be the case anywhere else where we get license applications for salmon farms. So. 
you know, I believe that there is an opportunity to expand an industry here, but to do it in a way that is clean, that is environmentally sound, and that can reassure coastal communities that it's being done properly. And I can ensure you uh, that, that we will not make any uh, decisions in terms of granting licenses without being able to give those guarantees. One of the other campaigns online now which is clearly strong is, uh, and I, I suspect may have come from the UK, uh, uh, is in relation to um, uh, what people are describing as a Badger Cull uh, programme in Ireland. Let me just put this into context uh, because we have been working really hard for the last um, a number of years uh, in trying to eradicate TB out of Ireland. Uh, this has been a huge problem obviously for people in the past but also for, um, for our livestock still. Uh, and we've made fantastic progress on this. Uh, and so what we are trying to do is we are, t we are trying to target um, problem areas which contribute to the spread of TB in the Irish herd. Uh, and if badgers are carrying TB, which they do, uh, well then we do target uh, badgers in areas where there are TB outbreaks. And if we have reason to believe that that outbreak is linked uh, to a badger population. Uh, and of course, if badgers themselves have, have TB, there's issues there as well. So from a welfare point of view, uh, surely the right thing to be doing here is to reduce the amount of TB in Ireland, both in badgers and, uh, and in our cattle herds. And that is what we're doing. Uh, we have less TB in Ireland now than at any time since records began back in about 1953. Uh, and, and so the TB eradication programme is actually working in Ireland. In fact, much more effectively than, is, than it's working in the UK. Uh, although, you know, I'm not going to comment on the UK's approach because that's, that's a matter for somebody else to decide on. But our approach in Ireland is working. We have a healthy badger population um, and we have a much healthier livestock population now versus TB. And so what we, are going, what we are continuing to do is have a humane and targeted cull of badgers, uh, which does not involve snares or anything like that. It involves trapping and catching badgers and then putting them down in as humane a way as we can. I will move away from culling badgers as soon as I believe that we can do that. We'll replace it with a badger vaccination program, I hope, in the not too distant future. We'll do that as soon as we think that we can do it without undermining the effectiveness of our overall TB eradication program. I mean, this, you know, from a compensation point of view for farmers would have been costing about 60 million euros a year in the past. It's now right down below 40 million euros a year. So we're making great progress and we will continue to do that. And of course, we have to take account of the welfare uh, of, of all animals with this, with this program. And that is what we're doing. And as I say, we will move from a badger, targeted badger cull in areas where there are outbreaks of TB to a targeted badger vaccination program as soon as we can, uh, we can do that without undermining the effectiveness of the overall program. Thanks very much. And um, by the way, I've just got this. Uh, it's an electric car. I've become uh, an electric car ambassador for, for ESB. Uh, I'm a big believer in the technology. Uh, basically, people can drive for free with no fuel costs, or virtually no fuel costs, uh, by switching from petrol and diesel driven engines to electric transport. Got a range of well over 100 kilometers, so if you're going to and from work uh, and it's not too far, these, this technology makes a lot of sense. And we're in the process now of putting together a, a really ambitious program for Cork City and its surrounds to make this area an electric car capital of Europe. But more to come on that. I will tell you more about it in the next couple of weeks. Thanks very much.